Welcome to Driver D Trains. Thanks for stopping by. I'm your host, Driver D. Our conductor and brakeman, Scratchy C, has been looking through some old issues of Model Railroader. Recently, I completed a series of videos on how to assemble and configure a basic DCC-EX command station to run our trains. If you haven't already seen those videos, be sure to check them out. In this video, I'll share some bonus materials I uncovered while researching the series. In my next series of videos, I will introduce you to the basics of JMRI, the Java Model Railroad Interface, and show you how to use JMRI with DCCEX and the Y Throttle and Engine Driver apps to program your locomotives and run your trains. Be sure to check this video's description for links to the original videos in the series, as well as to the various other videos, websites, and products I mention here. Also, if you are enjoying the videos, please leave a comment and hit the like button. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. This train is an extra and we've got several stops to make, so let's get things rolling. Assembling and configuring a DCC-EX command station. Bonus materials. It all started with trains. Even before there were full-size trains, there were scale model trains constructed by the railroad builders to ensure that their new designs worked. As trains became more common throughout the world, so too did toy trains. The earliest toy trains had no moving parts and were just intended to be pushed around by hand, if at all. As manufacturing standards improved throughout the 1800s, Toy trains became more sophisticated with rolling wheels, track, and clockwork mechanisms. In 1859, Napoleon III of France had built the first documented model railroad for his three-year-old son. The layout, built in a private park, has many of the common layout features we would recognize today. A figure eight track plan with a siding along one edge, turnouts, a crossing, a viaduct bridge, hills, and a station. A wind-up locomotive pulled two flat cars along the track. Looking at the only existing photo of the layout, you could almost imagine seeing it in a book of simple track plans. As electricity became more common in cities throughout Europe and America, toy manufacturers, new and old, began to manufacture electric toy trains. Marklin in Germany, which was known for manufacturing a line of dollhouse toys and accessories, branched into toy trains in 1891 in order to sell more toys for boys, and is credited with producing the first mass-produced train sets, which included a locomotive, cars, and sectional track. In 1896, Carlisle and Finch of Cincinnati, Ohio, developed the first toy trains to run on electricity supplied through the rails of the track. In 1901, Joshua Lionel Cowan developed his first Lionel electric model trains, not to sell as a toy, but to install as eye-catching displays in toy and department stores. Within a few years, electric model trains were everywhere. While model train production was halted during World War II due to the war effort, by the 1950s, trains had become the number one toy for boys in America. Model trains and computers have gone together since computers became a thing just after the war. If you haven't already seen it, be sure to watch the first two minutes of the Google YouTube series, Hacking Google. In the mid-50s, toy trains weren't something you got into because you wanted to change the world. It was a sleepy hobby for painting cars and carefully positioning trees. Until someone came along and saw model trains for what they really are, a network. The experimentalist brand of hacking that leads to innovation and technological breakthroughs owes its birth as much to the train clubs of the era as it does to the computer rooms. It all begins with model trains. 
One of the most well-known early examples of this was the Tech Model Railroad Club, or TMRC, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Chapter 1 of author Stephen Levy's best-selling book, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, published in 1984, talks specifically about the connection between the Tech Model Railroad Club at MIT and the birth of hacker culture. You can read it online at the Gutenberg Project, and Wired included an excerpt along with numerous photos of the MIT train room in November 2014 on the book's 30th anniversary. Here's a quote. There were two factions of the TMRC. Some members loved the idea of spending their time building and painting replicas of certain trains with historical and emotional value or creating realistic scenery for the layout. The other faction centered on the Signals and Power subcommittee of the club, and it cared far more about what went on under the layout. This was the system. S&P people were obsessed with the way the system worked, its increasing complexities, how any change you made would affect other parts, and how you could put those relationships between the parts to optimal use. Many of the parts for the system had been donated directly from the phone company. The club's faculty advisor was also in charge of the campus phone system and had seen to it that sophisticated phone equipment was available for the model railroaders. Using that equipment as a starting point, the railroaders had devised a scheme which enabled several people to control trains at once even if the trains were at different parts of the same track. Using dials appropriated from telephones, the TMRC engineers could specify which block of track they wanted control of and run a train from there. This was done by using several types of phone company relays, including crossbar executors and step switches, which let you actually hear the power being transferred from one block to another by an otherworldly chunka 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 sound. It was the S&P group who devised this fiendishly ingenious scheme, and it was the S&P group who harbored the kind of restless curiosity which led them to root around campus buildings in search of ways to get their hands on computers. Just days after his book was published, Levy attended a hacker conference in San Francisco. At one of the sessions, Stuart Brand, of Whole Earth Catalog fame, got into a discussion with Apple's Steve Wozniak on the nature of computer data and information. It was from the description of the hacker ethic in Levy's book that during this conversation, Brand coined the expression, information wants to be free. Today's open source movement is built on that ideal. Of course, MIT was not the only university to have a model train club, even within the same state. Not two hours drive west of MIT, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst also had a model train club with a layout hooked up to early computers. This well-known photo shows John A. N. Lee, the head of Amherst's new computer science program, working on an early digital equipment corporation, PDP-1, hooked to the train layout in 1968. Seventeen years later, in 1985, Lee penned a review of Levy's book, Hackers, published in the July 1985 issue of the Annals of the History of Computing. Here's a quote from Lee's review. What makes computing a nest for hackers? Why does it not occur elsewhere? Similar cults may well exist in electrical engineering, especially in ham radio and high fidelity audio systems. It's ironic that Lee missed the example of a similar cult literally right in front of him in the photo. Model railroading. The first model railroad club at Amherst dissolved in 1963. The Amherst Railway Society immediately replaced it, meeting for the first time on October 15th in Amherst's Gozman Laboratory, room 151. Five years later, it put on its first train show, which is now held every year in West Springfield. The annual Amherst Railway Society Railroad Hobby Show has become the largest model train show in the United States. In January 2024, as I was recording this video, the annual Amherst show hosted over 26,000 people and a record one-day number attended on Saturday. The event was live-streamed on multiple YouTube channels. Virtual Railfan had a camera set up overlooking their booth for the entire show. Welcome back to the Hobby Show, the Amherst Railroad Hobby Show 2024. I'm standing in front of the Atlas booth 
in the Mallory building. Heath from Humanity Junction, whose channel I featured in my third video, and whose version of John Allen's Time Saver helped inspire me to design the D-Saver layout, live streamed the show for four days, including interviewing dozens of vendors and guests and providing tours with his 3D camera. If you watched closely, sometimes you could even spot Heath on the virtual rail fan feed, checking out some of the new offerings from the Scale Trains booth. Next year's show will be January 25th and 26th, 2025. It all started with trains. Digital Command Control If I had to sum up DCC in one short sentence, it would be that DCC allows you to have significantly more control of your trains and layout by computerizing your model railroad. By installing electronic decoders in your locomotives and accessories and using a digital controller or throttle, along with a command station to connect them all together, you can run your locomotives and control your layout with computer-like precision and control. And by linking different systems together, you can find ways to operate your model railroad that would be impossible any other way. This means you can precisely control the speed and acceleration of your locomotives, run multiple locomotives at once at different speeds and in different directions, group locomotives into consists and run them together, and control a variety of lighting and sound effects independently on each locomotive. You can control them using wired throttles, wireless handheld throttles, smartphones, keypads, joysticks, timers, sensors, and over the internet from across the planet. But DCC is more than just controlling your locomotives. You can also control your track, turnouts, accessories with the same system, again with computer-like control. Model railroaders have always been looking for new and improved ways to control their trains. In the 1987 Walters catalog I had while working on my layout in college, there were already some early versions of digital control systems advertised on the pages. Then, in the October 1993 issue of Model Railroader magazine, the NMRA published its proposal for a new standard based on a system from Marklin, which had now been selling model trains for over 100 years, and that had been developed under contract by the German manufacturer Lenz. The idea was that both the electrical power to run the trains and the computerized digital signal, the stream of ones and zeros controlling the railroad and telling the train what to do, would travel down the same pair of wires to the track and the locomotive. The NMRA called this new standard Digital Command Control, or DCC for short. Describing their proposal, DCC Working Group Chair Stan Ames and co-author Rutger Freeberg explained, Using microcontrollers as the basis of a command control receiver lets a manufacturer develop products that can control a locomotive or accessory precisely the way the modeler wishes. Writing about the proposal, Model Railroader editor Andy Sparandale wrote, Imagine a command control receiver so small and so cheap that every locomotive would come with one installed at a price only slightly higher. While today, 30 years later, not every locomotive may come installed with DCC, the command control receivers, what we now call decoders, are definitely small, relatively cheap, and available in several styles from a number of manufacturers with a ton of features and options. Manufacturers continued to develop newer, smaller decoders with more and more features. And with the many different DCC control systems now available on the market, as well as open source systems like DCC EX, it's easier than ever to run DCC on your layout. In 2016, the NMRA adopted a new set of standards called Layout Command Control, or LCC, to extend DCC and provide additional options to control even more parts of the layout, and in 2021 signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the association working on implementing the new standards. Manufacturers are even now announcing their plans. The latest to get on board was Model Rectifier Corporation, or MRC, 
which announced at this year's Amherst train show that their new command station will support LCC. We've come a long way since that photo of John A. N. Lee with the PDP-1 in Amherst train room. Who knows what features our trains and layouts will have 30 years from now. The King of Italy In the year 774, the Frankish German king Charles the Great, an English called Charlemagne, invaded Italy and defeated the Italian kingdom of the Lombards. The Lombards, originally a German tribe that had migrated south and become Italians, ruled northern Italy for 200 years until the arrival of Charlemagne, who made himself king of the Lombards. As described by a pair of Italian historians in a line evoking Tolkien, thus ended Lombard Italy, and nobody can say whether this was, for our country, a fortune or a misfortune. Shortly thereafter, Charlemagne went on to Rome, and on Christmas Day had himself named Roman Emperor, the first Western European to hold that title in over 300 years. However, within a few generations, the empire had splintered, and in northern Italy, in particular, there was a period of chaos and instability, with many rulers claiming to be king at the same time. In the year 960, with Italy in turmoil, the Pope asked Charlemagne's heir, the Saxon king Otto, to come and restore order and defend the papacy. Otto assembled an army and marched to Italy, just as his ancestor had done, where he named himself King of Italy on Christmas Day, and the Pope crowned him Emperor of Rome. With his coronation as emperor, the Kingdom of Germany and the Kingdom of Italy were unified into what later became known as the so-called Holy Roman Empire. But many Italian Lombard nobles still ruled in northern Italy and wanted an Italian king. When Otto's 21-year-old grandson, Otto III, who had been king since the age of three and Roman emperor since the age of 16, suddenly died with a fever in the year 1002, the empire was left without an heir. Seizing this opportunity, the Lombard nobles in northern Italy, supported by the local Archbishop of Milan, quickly elected the Italian-born Margrave or Marquis of Ivrea, Imperial Count Palatine, to be the King of the Italians. Ivrea is a small town on a river at the foot of the Alps, and at the time was the local county capital, located in what was then the frontiers of northwestern Italy. The new king spent the next dozen years fighting his German rival, Henry, but it was events further south in Rome that would bring that war to an end. After Henry's choice for pope was forced to flee from Rome to Germany to beg for protection, Henry descended into Italy with his army, restored the pope, and was crowned Roman emperor on Valentine's Day of the year 1014. By this time, the king of Italy, now ill and tired, decided to surrender. He made peace with Henry, abdicated the throne, resigned his office as margrave, moved to a monastery he founded, and became a monk. He died the following year. Thus passed the last of the Italian kings of old Italy. In 1908, the Italian typewriter manufacturer, Camillo Olivetti, founded the company bearing his name in a suburb of Turin called Ivrea, located on a river at the foot of the Alps. While mostly known for its typewriters, Olivetti also produced programmable electronic calculators and computers of all sizes, ranging from mainframes to laptops. In the 1980s, Olivetti's PCs were sold in North America by both AT&T and Xerox under their own names. After changing hands several times, in 2003, Olivetti became part of Telecom Italia, Italy's largest telecommunications services provider. In June 2000, Telecom Italia and Olivetti together founded the Interaction Design Institute Ivrea Association, known as Interaction Ivrea, or IDII. Telecom Italia provided the new institute with a five-year endowment, while Olivetti hosted and housed the institute at its headquarters in Ivrea. From 2001 to 2006, IDII offered a two-year Interaction Design Master Course which graduated 56 students over the course of its five-year existence. After this, its curriculum was merged into another academy, and the institute was closed. In 2001, while at MIT, 
The American artist Casey Reyes, along with designer Ben Fry, developed the Processing Graphics Library and Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, using Java as a way of teaching non-programmers the fundamentals of computer programming in a visual context. In 2003, a Colombian master student at IDII named Hernando Barragan created a development platform called Wiring as his master's thesis project. Wiring is an open source electronics prototyping platform composed of a programming language, an IDE, and a single board AT Mega microcontroller. The project goal was to create simple, low-cost tools for creating digital projects by non-engineers. Baragan's thesis supervisor at IDII were Massimo Banzi and Casey Reyes, and the IDE Baragan used for wiring was derived from the processing IDE developed by Reyes. In 2005, Baragan's other advisor, Massimo Banzi, along with David Mellis, another IDII student, and David Quartielis, extended wiring by adding support for cheaper versions of the AT Mega microcontroller. Their goal was to keep the cost of building the project to less than the cost of a pizza. After building a prototype, they hired a local manufacturer to make a batch of 300 blank boards that they could hand out to IDII students, telling them to look up the instructions for how to assemble and program them online. Knowing that IDII was about to close, they made everything open source, Information wants to be free. That project has now gone on to become the most popular open source hardware project ever. And as of 2021, the company that grew from it has sold over 10 million boards. Looking for a name for their project, its creators found one over drinks at their local pub. Or more specifically, on the sign hanging over the door of the pub, which was itself named after the same man as the narrow cobblestone street in Ivrea on which it was located. The Bar de Rey Arduino, or King Arduino, located on the Via Arduino, named after Arduin, the Margrave of Ivrea, Imperial Count of the Palatine, and the last Italian king of Old Italy. DCC++ As I mentioned in my video on assembling a DCC-EX command station, DCC-EX is an upgraded version of an older open source program called DCC++, which was released in 2015 by a developer named Greg Berman. DCC++ included a DCC base station software package that ran on either an Arduino Uno or Mega, and a graphical user interface controller running in Java. Greg developed DCC++ on his own over a number of years and then introduced it to the world on the Train Board Forum website in August of 2015. Greg said that one of the reasons he created DCC++ was that he was disappointed with his commercial DCC system and he really wanted to automate his entire layout with JMRI, but JMRI was not compatible with his DCC controller at that time. Greg got lots of feedback on DCC++ and implemented several updates and improvements over a four-month period, but stopped updating the code in early 2016. Since then, many others have worked on the project, making updates and fixing bugs. And in 2020, the DCCEX team formally took over the project and began working on new versions, which I introduced you to in my series of videos. When most people think of DCCEX, they probably think of the EX Command Station DCC software package for the Arduino. This was a clean sheet rewrite of the DCC++ base station software with bug fixes, upgrades, and new features. What DCCEX did not copy over, however, was the incredible Java-based DCC++ controller Greg used to run his trains. This controller features a graphical user interface that can operate both trains and the layout. It features a throttle to control up to seven simultaneously operating locomotives, along with buttons for all of their DCC functions. The example shown here also features a full track plan of Greg's three-loop in-scale layout with operating switches, sensors, routes, and sidings. 
The controller can also be used to activate the programming track, program locomotive decoders, control accessories, and activate automations on the layout. There is even an informational display about the locomotives on the layout. I encourage you to watch the videos on Greg's YouTube channel where he demonstrates how the controller works. It's really amazing to see everything that Greg packed into it. And how did Greg make this remarkable controller? Using the processing IDE. The same processing that Ben Fry and Casey Rios developed at MIT that Hernando Baragan incorporated into his wiring thesis project at IDII that in turn led to the Arduino and its IDE. The DCC++ controller is not compatible with DCC EX because their command languages are not the same and the controller waits for a response from the command station that it never receives. But it can still send commands to DCC EX and operate a locomotive on the layout. We all owe a debt of gratitude to Greg for his work, as well as to those whose work he built upon, and those who built on Greg's work to make DCCEX what it is today and what it will become in the future. Maybe someday someone will rediscover Greg's DCC++ controller and port it over to DCCEX. In the meantime, Greg's original work is still available on GitHub. You can download his original DCC++ base station software, the Java-based DCC++ controller, and even a track plan of Greg's layout in the rail modeler format that I used to design my DSaver layout as shown in my third video. Again, be sure to check out Greg's YouTube channel where you can hear Greg explain how he developed DCC++ and see videos of DCC++ in action on his layout. As a final note, here's what Greg had to say about the challenges of creating the DCC++ system. I have tested both reading and writing on the programming track with eight different decoders, including two with sound cards by different manufacturers, and so far have not found a decoder that cannot be successfully programmed. Developing code that is robust enough to handle all of these different types of decoders was the second most difficult aspect of creating the DCC++ system itself. Ironically, the first most difficult aspect of the DCC++ system was actually producing these videos. What's next? An introduction to JMRI. In my next series of videos, I will introduce you to the basics of JMRI, the Java Model Railroad Interface, and show you how to use JMRI with DCCEX and the Y Throttle and Engine Driver apps to program your locomotives and run your trains. This initial series of videos will focus on JMRI's Decoder Pro app and JMRI throttles. I'll come back to the Panel Pro app and Turnout Control later. We've completed all our drop-offs and it's time to head back to the yard. We're running light, so enjoy the ride, feel the rhythm of the rails, and remember, it's all about the journey. Until then, thanks for watching. Well, Scratchy, did you find anything good in the old magazines? Yes, prices have gone up, haven't they? All aboard! <laughs>